So I thought a lot of a kid about what I wanted to be when I grew up. I didn't become any of those things. Okay? Being a pastor was not on my radar. Uh, but one day I finally made my decision when I was a kid, right, that I was going to be a world famous inventor. Yeah, Phil was like, dude, you should have done that, man. Then we wouldn't have to deal with you here. No, but uh, I wanted to be an inventor. I, I thought it would be so cool to create things that nobody had ever thought of before. But I made a sacrifice, right? Eventually, forsaking that path to change the world with inventions to accept a call to ministry. You're welcome. Yeah, I know. So it's, I gave it all up for this call for Jesus because you know what? The hover cars and the time machines that I would have made, they're not getting anybody to Jesus, amen? amen. All right, so uh, I wanted to be an inventor. I remember hearing once that to invent something successfully, you needed to identify a problem and find a creative way to solve it. Look for a problem, create the solution. I'm not sure I would have ever come up with anything really groundbreaking, uh, but check out these winners that have really changed the course of history. Some awesome inventions. What you see now is the selfie toaster. Anybody have a selfie toaster? This is for those mornings when you feel the need to be even more self-centered. Selfie toaster engraves your bread with that beautiful face of yours with the perfect way to start your morning. Selfie toaster. How about the next one? Chopstick noodle fan. When fresh cooked noodles are just a little too hot, Cool off each bite with ease. Put a fan on your chopsticks and never burn your tongue again. Am I selling you on these? Right? Yeah. Somebody's pulling out their phone on Amazon right now. I need that. I can't wait. How about this next one? The car exhaust grill. After a long commute home, who wants to hit the kitchen and cook dinner? Me either. Cook those hamburgers on the go with the car exhaust grill. Worried about dangerous toxins that you might consume when you eat the burger later, you're not alone. Don't eat out of one of these. And lastly, ever scared of getting germs on your hands, but you're not a fan of normal gloves like other people? Try hander pants. It's underpants for your hands to protect those dandy hands of yours from any and all surfaces. And don't worry about the fact that they don't actually cover your fingers. These things are so stylish, you'll soon forget why you even put them on in the first place. Hand or pants. Go order a pair today. Some real winter inventions up here today, right? We create and invent with the goal of solving common problems. But what do we do about those problems we try and try to solve that we just can't seem to fix with our own human creativity? What do we do about the much deeper issues within our souls that can't be cured by our own efforts. See, if we're all honest, there are some things inside of us that we just can't fix. Some deep, real problems of brokenness and sin in some aspects of ourselves that we are completely unable to mend. This morning, we're launching this new series called I Am in which we're going to be breaking down these seven I am statements that Jesus made in the Gospel of John. Seven times in John's Gospel, Jesus makes the statement, I am blank. I am blank. And every time Jesus is addressing a soul problem to which he is our only true help. He points to our lack and then to himself as our provision. Jesus points to our problems and says, I am the cure to these things. He's saying, you have this problem, and I am what you are not. I am what you could never be for yourself. I am divine. I am God. I am the cure for all of these soul issues that you cannot remedy yourself. In all of the I am statements, Jesus points to a problem to which he is the only solution. And without him, we would be hopeless See, if Jesus really is what he claims to be in these I am statements, then a loss of Jesus and not having Jesus right, is no solution to the problem because there's no solution because th these are things that we cannot take care of on our own. Rebecca McLaughlin says this, if Jesus is the bread of life, I'm going to kind of spoil some of these I am statements for you here. If Jesus is the bread of life, loss of Jesus means starving. If Jesus is the light of the world, Loss of Jesus means 
darkness. If Jesus is the good shepherd, loss of Jesus means wandering alone and lost. If Jesus is the resurrection and the life, then loss of Jesus is eternal death. And if Jesus is the Lamb of God sacrificed for our sins, loss of Jesus means paying that price for ourselves. We also remember this through this series, that when Jesus says, I am, it's not the first time God used these words to claim his deity and his power and his godness. Right All the way back in the book of Exodus, God called Moses through a burning bush to go and lead the nation of Israel out of the hands of the Egyptians. And in this moment of panic and fear and confusion that Moses was experiencing, he says, well, when I tell the others of the name of the God who sends me to do this thing, what shall I say? And God says this, I am. I am. I am that I am. Bigger than words or titles that you could place on God. Beyond time, beyond space, having always existed eternally before the universe was ever breathed out of his mouth, God was. I am that I am. And you can't comprehend my infinite and eternal power and my goodness. And that's the kind of God that's going to be on your side. This is what he's conveying to Moses here. I am, and I'm beyond anything you could comprehend. And this God who's bigger than anything you could put into a box is the one that is by your side. I'm always in control. I always will be. I am. And the same God who spoke those words through a burning bush years before declares again, I am. I am all that you need. I am the God who has stepped into your mess to bring healing you can't find within yourself. If you're reading along this morning, we're going to be in uh, the Gospel of John chapter 6, and we're going to read from verses 22 through 35. But first, let me give you some context to kind of set the stage to this scene that we're going to read. This is following two miracles. Jesus had just performed the famous miracle of feeding thousands of people with five little loaves of bread and a couple of fish. Jesus, knowing how popular that this was going to make him, uh, retreated up to a mountain to be alone. And then his disciples set off across the sea where they then found themselves panicking in the middle of a storm. In the middle of their panic, they look out on the ocean and there's Jesus taking a a stroll, a stroll across the waves to get back to them. And they let him on the boat and immediately the storm calms and they arrive onto the shore. So Jesus just fed the thousands of people with a kid's happy meal. And then Jesus just walked on water to meet his disciples. We're going to pick up here in verse 22. It says, The next day the crowd that had stayed on the opposite shore of the lake realized that only one boat had been there, and Jesus had not entered it with his disciples. But they had gone away alone. Then some boats from uh, Tiberias landed near the place where the, the people had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. Once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. When you feed stray pups, what happens? They come back. You feed the stray pups, they come back to the hand that gave to them. And here come the people, right, looking for Jesus where he fed the masses the day before. Where is this miracle food man that filled our stomachs yesterday. Pick him back up. It says, when they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? And Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Boom, roasted. You are looking for me, not because of who I am, but because of what I have done for you. Jesus says in a much kinder way, you're full of greed and materialism, right? You don't want the God who provides, you simply want the provision, and you're missing the point. And honestly, we're guilty of this too. We struggle so bad with this, like, like that this is still a problem today that we're often more enamored by the blessings of God than we are by God himself. We're looking beyond the source of all good things to the things, And we're more caught up in what God can give us than knowing who God is and being with him. So then Jesus challenges them to do something that I want to challenge all of us with today. 
to think beyond their physical needs to see the seriousness of their spiritual needs. Jesus goes on to say, Do not work for the food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, What must we do to do the works that God requires? And Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. They ask, what do we need to do? What work does God require to find this bread of eternal life that you're talking about? And Jesus says, the only work required of you is to believe. To believe in the true bread that he has sent. To believe in God's Son. Belief in the Son of God who takes away the sins of the world. Put your faith in his finished work and not your own. This wasn't enough for them. They asked again, what sign will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? See, our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. We want this bread that you're talking about. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Their response to Jesus again was, Jesus, give us a sign. Like the manna in the wilderness that God provided for our ancestors before and Jesus said it was God that sent that provision, and now he's sent another provision that is the bread of life that has come to revive the world, and you're looking at him. Right? Give us this bread, they began to plead. Not understanding, they were standing face to face with it. I am the bread of life, and no soul that comes to me will ever hunger again. I am the bread of life. So you're still talking about lunch, saying, yeah, give us this bread. But Jesus says, I'm talking about something better. And what Jesus was teaching this hungry crowd 2,000 years ago is the same good news for hungry people sitting here today. If we could summarize this, what Jesus is teaching in this story. The first thing would be this, that our spiritual need outweighs our physical need. Our spiritual need outweighs our physical need. See, this crowd was so concerned with their next meal that they were missing the Messiah right in front of them. The immediate need of hunger was so loud that they couldn't see their greater need for a greater hunger within them. Any you guys ever guilty of being hangry? Yeah. Oh, Carmody's like, yep, yeah, I've seen that before. Yet we get hangry, right? We have this like immediate, like, oh, I've got to eat something now. Or like, I can't think straight. I can't be kind to people, right? And so there's this like immediate need that's easy for us to see within ourselves. I still see some couples like fighting, like, no, that's you, that's you. But we have these immediate needs. They showed up to see what Jesus could give them. They were more concerned with the blessings of Jesus than knowing the person of Jesus. The crowd came for the bread, but Jesus had a greater gift, right? There is a greater hunger than your physical hunger. It's this spiritual hunger, this spiritual void that only God could fill. The crowd came for the bread, but Jesus had a greater gift. But it takes some time to shift the thinking of the people from their immediate cravings to see the deeper problems inside of them. See, this miracle that just happened before this scene, the bread that was multiplied the day before, it was nothing compared to the provision to come that Jesus would offer the world. So we can't be fooled by the immediate, right? The earthly needs, the little pains in this life that are like a temporary hungry stomach or any other trivial temporary problems and miss what we need the most. And all of the miracles Jesus performed for people He was always pointing to a much greater spiritual need. 
Think about the story when Jesus went to heal, uh, heal the paralytic man who had been lowered through the roof by his friends. What does Jesus say to him first before he heals him? Your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. Why? Why does Jesus start there? Right? Because healing him to rise and walk was incredible, but the more pressing need for him and for all of us is the damaged, sin-cursed, dead hearts within us that need brought to life by the power of the gospel. Right? We looked at a paralyzed man, we would say, yeah, his greatest need is to have his legs fixed to, for him to be able to walk again. But that's not the greatest need, and that's why Jesus started with forgiveness. Right? It's, it's telling us here, like, yeah, there's this physical need here, but the greater need is for the grace of God to change your heart. Through Jesus, yeah, paralyzed legs can be made to walk. But what about your soul that's going to go on to exist for the rest of eternity? It's damaged and it's broken and it's in need of healing. And while a broken leg seems more pressing right now in this world, in this moment, we have a greater need. And we've got to shift our thinking from the immediate physical need to see how desperate we are to have that spiritual need met. The crowd that came to Jesus, they sought a temporary meal, but Jesus offered a solution for their souls. The second thing we learn here is that Israel's manna was a picture of a greater provision that would be the true bread of Jesus. Right? I love seeing these connections where, like, all the way back in Exodus, God's providing manna, and that's not some just, like, thing that God decided to do, like this accidental thing, but this is pointing us ahead to the gospel, right? That all of scripture's working together to tell this story. And all the way back when Israel had been uh, provided with this manna, it was a picture of Jesus. Let's revisit this conversation between Jesus and this crowd, right? What Jesus said wasn't enough for them. And they said, well, we still need more proof. We want a sign. They pointed to this Old Testament miracle when Moses advocated for Israel and supplied them with manna, bread from heaven in the wilderness. But Jesus stops them in their tracks here. He says, Moses was not the source of your provision. God was the source of your provision. And now through Jesus, God was offering something much greater than just bread. He's making a way for souls to be reconciled back to the Father and filled in a new and different way. The manna in the Old Testament was a picture of the gospel, a symbol of the true bread that was to come. In the book of Exodus, God's provision for his lost and hungry people looked like manna from the sky. And each day he would supply them with all they needed to have enough substance to make sure they had their fill. This man is a picture of Jesus, who would come to be the ultimate provision. What our souls really, really longed for. More than just bread to fill a temporary hunger, but bread of life that would satisfy our souls once and for all. Manna was the bread for today. Jesus is the bread of life for all eternity. The manna would remind Israel daily of the God who sustains us. And the bread of life in Jesus reminds us that God is the source and sustainer of our salvation. He cares for us enough to offer the daily bread and also uh, to meet our eternal uh, needs through the finished work of Jesus. You want a sign like manna from Moses? You don't realize the greater bread is here. The greater bread has arrived take and accept the true bread another thing we learn from from this story jesus alone is the true bread jesus alone is the true bread see these i am claims are exclusive meaning when jesus says i am this thing Jesus says he is something. Other things cannot also be that thing. It's an exclusive claim. Jesus is the bread of life, and nothing else can be that bread for you. 
Right? This is the claim. It's exclusive. Jesus is saying, I am the bread of life. Everything else in your life will fail to be that thing. All other attempts to, to curb that hunger in your soul will fall flat and lead you to despair and hopelessness. The hunger that Jesus satisfies cannot be satisfied by other things in this world. Money, careers, spouses, sex, drugs, alcohol, fame, popularity, looks, or anything that we think can bring ultimate satisfaction and fulfillment apart from Jesus. They just won't cut it. And that's what Jesus is saying. I am the bread of life. None of those other things can be. Candace and I just got back a couple weeks ago from Disney World with some family. It was super fun. Somebody asked me on the way in this morning, like, was it restful? Do you feel like <laughs> you're laughing now? Because, yes, it was one of, definitely one of those trips. You come back and you need to sleep for like a week to recover from that. Uh, but we just got back from Disney. One of my favorite things about Disney was all of the different food. I love food. Uh, and there's so many choices. There's a lot of diversity there at Disney World, uh, things to eat. So the first night when we arrived, we had a reservation at this super nice place. Uh, we had just traveled all day. So, you know, we sit down and it's like game on. Like nobody wants to talk. Nobody wants to do anything except for eat. It's an appetizer kind of night, right? So, so we order an appetizer. Everyone's tired and hangry and we need food now. So we ordered this non-bread platter. It was like a, there was like four different types of non-bread, like cooked different ways, like different flavors. And uh, so they bring this thing out. It's four different types of non-bread and it's got nine different sauces to try with them. I'm like, this is so much fun. Like, I'm going to try this. and I, So we're, like, reaching all over the table, and, like, I'm trying this bread, dipping in these four sauces, and then this bread, and I'm dipping in here. And we looked crazy, reaching around the table, reaching over each other, and I'm getting my fill of bread. And you know how it is with a, an appetizer like that. By the time the real food comes out, I'm not even hungry anymore because I just ate, like, five pounds of bread. But we look like madmen, and we're eating, and we're eating, and I'm trying this bread, and I'm trying this bread, and I'm trying this bread, and I'm trying this, and this, and this, and this. But like any other meal that I've ever eaten in my life, it filled that void and that hunger for a little while, and then the next morning, I was hungry again. Right? I ate so much bread, but I was still left feeling hungry. And sometimes we spiritually look a lot like Josh eating five pounds of non bread off a platter. And we're reaching for all those different things that we think can fill our hunger. But in the end, we still feel empty. I'll try some of this, and maybe this relationship will finally make me feel satisfied in my soul. Or if I could just prioritize my career and get to this next place, I'll feel fulfillment and I'll feel satisfaction. Or if I could just fill my soul with a little bit of this and a little bit of this and a taste of this, then finally I'll feel fulfilled and satisfied. And in the end, we still feel empty because none of those things are meant to give you what you need on a soul level, what Jesus alone can give you. See, looking for anything apart from God to give you the security and joy that only he can give you, that's called idolatry. Idols are things we think we need to have in order to find joy and security and satisfaction ahead of Jesus. An idol is a different bread. It's a different bread that you're looking to fill your hunger in your soul that it wasn't designed to fill. So let me ask you, what is that temporary bread that you keep looking for? Can you identify anything in your life you think you absolutely have to have to be satisfied, to find security, to find joy apart from Jesus. That's an idol. And it's temporary bread that will fill you for a minute, but leave you hungry for more. If you're putting your hope in any of those things to be enough, you're feasting on the wrong bread. And in time, you're going to ask, why doesn't it feel like this is ever enough? Because it was never meant to be enough. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. In me, your soul will find what no other thing can be or do for you. 
I am the bread of life. Jesus addresses a problem we can't fix, that there's a hunger within me that I can't fill with anything else. And Jesus says, I see the problem, I am the solution. You have this hole that needs filled. You have this sickness that you can't cure. I am the remedy. Stop feasting on the things that cannot deliver. Jesus alone is the bread of life. Our first I am statement. I am the bread of life. The solution to the problems we cannot fix. We have souls that are starving for a Savior, and only Jesus can satisfy with what we need. Jesus alone is the bread that will satisfy and sustain us. We can't remain deceived by the temporary fixes instead of looking to Jesus to be our fill. He is the bread of life who provides the lasting fulfillment and joy that our souls are yearning for. If Jesus really is the bread of life, then loss of Jesus means starving. Lean into the true bread this morning to fill the sole problem that you can not. Jesus is the bread of life. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I just want to invite you into a time of reflection. A time to ask yourself some questions. The most important question being this. Have you accepted the true bread of life named Jesus? You can stumble through this life trying everything else to satisfy your soul, and you'll still remain hungry. Jesus exclusively is the bread of life that our souls are starving for. Have you accepted that bread? Have you accepted the forgiveness and the grace of Jesus? I read a quote this week from Max Lucado. He said of this, bread of life? Jesus lived up, lived up to the title. But an unopened loaf does a person no good. Have you received the bread? Have you received God's forgiveness? I want to ask you this morning, have you received the bread? Have you looked to Jesus to be your one Savior, your one way back to God? I want to invite you to do that this morning. To choose Jesus, to follow Jesus, to say, Jesus, I'm putting my faith and trust in you. I believe that you are that true bread that my soul is longing for. If you want to make that decision today, I just want to help walk you through what it looks like. I'm going to say a prayer and you don't have to repeat it word for word. It's not a magic prayer. You have to say perfectly or word for word. But you can pray something along these lines in your heart, from yourself to God, to accept Jesus as that true bread this morning. You say, Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that my sin separates me from you. But I'm putting my faith and trust in the finished work of Jesus. to be what earns my righteousness and brings me back to God. Jesus, I believe who you are. I believe what you did. I'm putting my faith and trust in you. Would you be my fill? Would you be my fix? Would you be the bread that satisfies my soul? Maybe you, for the first time this morning, made a decision to follow Jesus. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to ask you to put your hand up or stand up or anything, but I just want to ask that you would do this. On a connection card this morning, something you can find in your pew, 
I want you to write these words. I chose Jesus. I chose Jesus. I'm done trying to find satisfaction from everything else in the world. I'm believing that Jesus really is the true bread that my soul is starving for. Maybe you've been following Jesus for most of your life. And maybe this morning you need to to make a decision that you're going to turn away from the idols, the, the temporary bread in your life that you've still looked for to find satisfaction and fulfillment in your soul. Maybe this morning you just need to say, Jesus, I'm sorry for, for feasting on other bread. God, I know it's you and you alone that can bring me salvation. Whatever that looks like for you this morning, just spend, spend a minute just reflecting. Asking God to move in your heart. Settling anything that you may need to 